to record it. I already started the recording. Okay, Perfect. so Thank this you. is going to record and let's see what happens. Okay, so basically like this. Um, Chachamim come and they say the following. We're in the middle of the story where the story says that what happened was is that you had a person that he was, again, he goes into the yeshiva, nothing is getting into the learning. He cannot get his head into the understanding. So what happens? Or Shiva tells him, be in charge of all the administration, you know, like you're going to be in charge of maintenance, of this, of that, you know, fundraising, but you just won't, but at least you're going to be in the yeshiva. He said, fine. All of a sudden, there's a technical problem with the lights. He starts calling electricians. After getting all the electricians coming, finally, they find he found the problem himself. He was looking into it, and he finds the problem. When he finds the problem, he comes to the Shiva and he says, look, or Shiva, I found the issue, a simple change, and it changed everything. It saved everything. So the Shiva is all happy. And he comes and he tells him, you know what? Did you ever hear a person called Thomas Alva Edison? So he said, yes. He says he invented the light bulb. He says you should know that he wasn't the first one that really invented the light bulb. There were a few people even before him that they made it. He was the one that made the light bulb that we were able to use it, we were able to utilize it. He says, why? It took him four years and more than 2,000 trials in order for him to succeed to make it. So he turns to the Bakhur and he says, did you try for four years and 2,000 times to make sure that you can't learn? That maybe the learning of the Torah will come inside of you? He says, this is a message from the Shemayim that maybe you should turn on your light bulb. That maybe you should realize what's going on and understand that really, Bemet, it's not too late. And I mentioned it in the shiur this, or it was actually last night. I said, it, there, was a, there was an older man that he should live for 120, right? That he started learning from Venezuela. He started learning with us three, four years ago. We started a program in the morning, Zomesech Migila Gemara. It was the first time in his life learning Gemara. He was 80 years old at the time. He says, Rabbi, look at this. I'm 80 and now I'm starting to learn Torah. I told him, you should know, you are going to obligate everybody else. I said, why? He says, just like it says that Hillel was going to obligate the poor people. Because Hillel used to make, let's say, a dollar a day. Obviously, it was in his coins. He used to give half of it to the Beit HaMidrash in order to get in to learn. And half of it he used to go and give it to his family. He had nothing. One day it was snowing. He wasn't able to work. Right? It was snowing too much. He couldn't get into the Beit HaMidrash. He went on the roof and he started learning on the roof. That's what he started doing. So therefore, Moises, no, no, just leave it. Ignore it because he's here. So what happened was, is that all of a sudden what happens is, is that he says, he goes onto the roof, he starts freezing. And all of a sudden the rabbis, they come and they say, why is it that we have so much shade? Saying it doesn't make sense. They look up and they see an image on the roof. They went up, they took him down, they had to put him in hot water and this and that. He almost froze to death. So therefore the Gemara says, he's going to obligate all the poor people. Because the poor people are going to come and they're going to say, listen, why didn't we learn Torah? We had no money. He says, what, were you poor that he led? That he had to actually pay half his salary every single day to get into the Beit HaMidrash to learn Torah? And he still did it? And when he wasn't able to afford it, he went on the roof to start learning, to start listening to the Torah? So obviously, it's a very important concept. However, though, I wanted to take now a little bit of a, to go astray a little bit and to take the shiur that I gave from this morning a little bit to the side. You had a question, Mauricio? Yes, Rabbi, a question. Okay, I, and I've heard many times the story about Hillel, and, but I also I learned that when, after 120 years, they don't want to compare us why you were not like Hillel since he was in a different level. They just said they would compare us with people in our own generation, which is completely different from, you know, what Hillel did. So in this case, how you can uh, how you can say like today, okay, if you have no money, you should study if Hillel did it. It's I always learn that it's completely different. It's not like they won't compare you with Moshe or with Abraham or with Isaac. Hundred percent. But the concept is like this: even though they're not going, they're going to understand that you're in a completely different generation. And since you're in a completely different generation, you have to act that way. And the little that we do is enormous in comparison to what they used to do, because they were obviously much more spiritual. But the concept behind it is, 
the mimit chayev, the obligation. Because a lot of us might come and say, you know what? Why didn't I learn Torah? I wasn't smart enough. This actually once happened with Eliyahu Navi. It's brought down, I don't remember if it's in the Tanat of Eliyahu or it was in the Biura Lacha. I think it's the Biura Lacha. The Biura Lacha in Siman Kufnun He, I think it is. He speaks about the learning of the Torah. And he says that no matter how much we learn, we're always going to be asked by a Kadosh Baruch Hu, why didn't we learn more? And we could have learned much more. So Eliyahu Navi met this trapper, this hunter, and he was fishing, he was doing all these different traps and everything. So he starts speaking to him. And he starts telling him, how did you trap the fish? And he says, no, this, that, with all this wisdom. And then all of a sudden he comes and he asks him, why don't you learn Torah? So he says, I don't have the mind for it. My, my, my mind, my, you know, my brain, it doesn't go in. He went and he tells him, I don't understand. You think that HaKadosh Baruch Hu, that he's the one that gives you the, the strength and he gives you the mind the brain, right? The wisdom. He's only going to give you wisdom to do what you want to do, but learning Torah, you're not going to have it. But rather what? It means that you didn't really actually try. And therefore you have to try, right? Remember that we always say there's nothing that stands in front of, of uh, there's nothing that stands in front of the will of a person. I actually saw something very interesting. Let me see if I could actually get it very quickly. Um, that the Gdolim actually said, let me see if I could find it very quickly. It was, it was, it was I have to say it word by word because I don't want to misquote it. And it said like this, he said, Lo, it's, this is brought down by Rav Meir Shapiro. Remember Rav Meir Shapiro from Lublin was the, the one that instituted the Daf Yomi that we have. It could have been that it was already started before him, but he was the one that disseminated the idea throughout the entire world. So it says here, the willpower does not come from the strength within you, but rather the strength within you comes from the willpower. That means everything starts from the willpower. Do you want to do it or don't you want to do it? Many times I come and ask a balabait, do you want to do something? Yeah, I'll try. I said, don't give me you'll try. Because if you say you'll try, it means that you don't want to do it. No, 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 but Rabbi, Rabbi, I'm going to try. I said, if you're going to try, you're going to come. You understand? Because if you really want to do something, there's nothing that's going to be in front of you. There's nothing that will stop you. And when you really want to do something, you reach down to some extra force that within you that you never knew that was born within you. There was once a person... Right? That what happened was is that it collapsed. I don't remember if it was a pole or a tree on top of someone. And the guy was underneath. He was basically dying. The guy came and basically picked it up and the guy got the guy out of there. They went afterwards, they interviewed him. They said, look, this guy must be a bodybuilder, this, that, how strong he is. They went and they asked him, do you pick up weights? Never in my life. So how much can you pick up? I don't know. Give me weights. I don't know. He starts coming at 20, 30, 40 pounds. He says, do you know that that weighs 200 pounds, 250 pounds? How does he do it? Well, there is a will, is, there is a way. There is a will, there is a way. If you really put your mind to something, there is nothing that will actually stop you from getting there. And that's why I did mention at the end, right, of the shiur that I gave this uh, last night, I went and I mentioned the story of the Rav Panovich. Because the Rav Panovich was dreaming. And they said, you're a dreamer. What, you think? They, they just finished the Holocaust. We were I'm almost obliterated. We were almost gone. And now you're going to come and you're going to tell me that what's going to happen over here? It doesn't make sense. What did he say? He said, it could be that I'm dreaming, but I'm not sleeping. The majority of people in this world, they are sleeping. I don't remember which one of the Rabbanim, they went and they were speaking to one of their students. And he went and he said, you know that this world is a cemetery. It's a cemetery? What does that mean? You go to the cemetery, there's a Beta Chaim, and there you go, you see dead people. He says, no, no, no. He opens up the window, the blinds, and he comes, look, that person, uh, you know, Moishi the tailor, he says, that guy over there, he killed himself. He says, why? He's walking around, but look in his hands, he could have had a sefer. He could have learned so much Torah that he could have published an entire sefer. And then you'll see the other one over there, right? Yaakov, the, I don't know what his name is. Yeah, the shoemaker, right? He... He could have been this other gown and the other one, and you continue going. He 
He said, what happens is that people don't realize their potential and they bury themselves. You're making they me feel bad, them. Rabbi. <laughs> Listen, Mauricio, you're, you're, not, you're not 80 years old. You could still start now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, every single day. That's it. Boom, boom. That's the way it goes. Yeah. So the 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 the, the story that I actually brought down in the shoot was a 28 year old. Rabbi Akiva was a 40 year old. Okay. And think about it, Rabbi Akiva. We once mentioned this, if you remember the past. Rabbi Akiva, he built an empire. Imagine right now you build a company with 24,000 people staff underneath you, and within worse than Corona. Right within a time of half the time from Pesach to Shavuot, we're talking about around 30 days, one month. Right, the virus, how long was it? Two months, three months, we're still in the virus, yeah, and it killed everything. One month destroyed 24,000 students. Your entire empire, everything that you have, the Imperium is gone underneath him. How many of us would give up? How many of us would be coming at your depression and just say, you know what? HaKadosh Baruch Hu, it wasn't even an empire of, a, of, a, of, a, of negocios, of, of a, how do you call it, of business. I'm learning. We're learning Torah. We're disseminating Torah. We're doing it for you, not for me. What does he do? He doesn't give up. He comes and he takes five students, and with those five students, he illuminates the entire world. We're talking about the greatest of the great. Now remember, these five were not even the greatest of what he had before. So imagine how much Torah we would have had. And that's why I always mention that after the Holocaust, I still remember my Rabbanim always telling me that they always used to say, you have to remember, every single Jew has to look around him that there's another thousand Jews beside him that he's obligated for. Which means that when you do an action, you're not doing an action for yourself. You're doing an action for another thousand Jews. Because if six million perished, take them their children, grandchildren, and if they wouldn't have perished, imagine how many more Jews you would have had around you. And therefore, you are held responsible for another minimum of a thousand people beside you. And every single action that you do, whether it's going to be you're learning Torah, you're doing mitzvot, you're doing something, have that in mind. Because at the end of the day, we are held accountable for it. And that's why it's so important. Okay? So that was just a little bit, even though I wanted to focus today on something a little bit different, which is connected to the story that I brought down, but it's also connected to Parashat Balak. In Parashat Balak, so the first part was the Paraduma, which again, and then if you want, you can listen to the shiur that I gave last night, or I have it in the YouTube this morning also, and you could see it and you could understand what was the secret behind the Paraduma of not giving up hope, understanding our potential. I mentioned a whole bunch of quotes of Thomas Edison, about how many times we're so close to success but we just give up and we don't realize that we're already there. And you know, all the beautiful concepts that again, there's nothing that stands in front of us. However though, when we go to Parashat Balak, it's another interesting story. The story is based upon where you had the king, Balak, that he wanted to rent out, he wanted to pay Bil'am Arashad, Bil'am was the prophet of the non-Jews, right? He was at the same level of prophecy or even greater than Moshe Rabbeinu. And what happened was, is that he wanted to rent him out to curse the Jewish nation. He was afraid of them. So he knew the only way to get rid of them is to curse them. Fine. All of a sudden, what happens is, is that he starts, right? He calls Bilam. Bilam says, sorry, I can't come. Hashem told me no. Okay? Bilam comes, right? And Balak sends other messengers, more important emissaries and important officials. He comes and he says, no again. Again, he sends him. He says, you know what? If you really want, go. But you have to say exactly what I say. Meaning don't change a, a moment of what it is. So everyone already speaks about the entire concept. What's going on here? Right? He's asking Hashem. And then Hashem tells him no. He's asking again and asking again. So they all give the example that many times this happens with our own children. Our children come and they ask us, yeah, daddy, papa, papi, whatever it is. You know, can I go to this uh, birthday party, to this bar mitzvah, to this overnight? What do you tell them? No. Why no? Nothing what to talk about. Fine. Next time. Listen, no, because of this, because of that. A third time you say, you know what, just do whatever you want. Yeah, that's what happens. So therefore, it's not that the parent really wants, but he just, that's it. He's already tired. Okay, just go. Yeah, just go. 
he gives up. You want to ask something, Jimmy? No? I was saying hi to my to my to my son. Sorry. Ah, okay. <laughs> sorry, no okay. Sorry, sorry. Okay. So what happened was is that fine. So he gives him the permission to go, and Bilam starts going. The donkey comes, and this is the famous donkey of Bilam that opens up its mouth and it starts speaking to human beings. Imagine what a type of a donkey. Yeah. And the donkey, the first time, goes astray. Yeah, he goes off the path. Bilam comes, what's going on here? Boom, starts hitting the donkey. Yeah. Okay. Second time around, he comes, he crushes his leg. Third time, he just jumps down. Every single time, Bilam is like getting more upset, hitting the donkey, saying, what's going on with you? Continue. Finally, HaKadosh Baruch Hu opens up the eyes of Bilam. And he sees a malach. Yeah, and the malach has a sword in front of him. And Bilam all of a sudden is all afraid. He sees the malach. He's like, uh, <laughs> I'm in trouble now. So he comes and he says, what's going on? So he says, you should know I was going to kill you and leave the, long, leave the donkey alive. Right? But the donkey spoke to Bilam. The donkey told Bilam, out of all the times, did I ever go, did I ever do something against you? I was fiel, I was very devoted, I was trustworthy. What do you want to do? Even the people that were with Bilam, they started thinking, what's going on here? This goy is going to come and he's going to curse right, the entire Jewish nation. And to his own donkey, he has to take out a sword and he's going to kill him with a sword. He should have said a name and to kill him on the spot. But no. So... Chachamim Kam, this is based on Rabbi Friend, he has an entire book called Listen to Your Messages. An entire book called Listen to Your Messages. I once, I once brought it down and I told you guys that it's an incredible book, that you should read it. What does he say there? He asks a very simple question. Why did Hashem want to kill Bilam? What did Bilam do wrong? He asked him. At the end of the day, he said yes. He gave him the permission to go. So why is he going to kill him? Why does he send an angel to kill Bilam? And the answer is, is I think that this is a very important episode that we have to understand. And the answer is, is as follows. We have to understand that many times in life, HaKadosh Baruch Hu sends us messages. All the time, he's sending us messages. We just have to open up our eyes to see those messages. And when we see those messages, we are lucky. However, though, if he continues seeing, sending messages and we block the messages, we put it on silent, on snooze, right? I'm going to silent it for another year. Yeah, that's a good one. No, you silent it for another year. What's up? That's it. I don't want to hear from it for another year. Yeah, or you put it on silent or you block them. What happens is a person could be even obligated to the death penalty. Because Hashem is telling you, wake up. Why don't we wake up? Why don't we smell the coffee? Why don't we realize that he's sending us the messages? So Bilam here, he should have realized, one second, what's going on here? I'm coming with this donkey. The donkey never in his life did he do such a thing. And he went away, went astray the first time. Second, and there's nothing there. I'm looking. There's nothing. What's going on? So why don't you check the donkey? Why don't you check? But he didn't. He didn't pay attention to the donkey. What did he do? He wanted to hit it. To hit the donkey even more. What did the donkey do wrong to you? The donkey's a messenger. Did the messenger do anything wrong? He didn't do anything. But listen to the message. If you listen to the messages, you'll be able to see what Hashem wants from you. If chas shalom you don't, then it doesn't happen. How many times does it happen, right, that a person wants to do an avirah? Right, imagine right now you're speaking on the phone, Right? You want to say a juicy piece of Lashon and all of a sudden, boom, the connection hangs up. Right? That's the new kosher phone, by the way. They're trying to invent it. The new kosher phone is that you come, when you speak, if you speak Lashon and it just turns off. Right? You speak in the air. Right? There's nothing there. You understand? That's the kosher phone. Yeah? But the thing is, why didn't you pay attention? Why didn't you realize? All of a sudden, you want to do an Avedah, your father comes, your mother comes. Something happens. Why don't you realize? Hashem is sending you a message. And you know what? That's exactly what happened by Yosef HaTzadik. Yosef HaTzadik, it says in the Gemara, according to one opinion, he wanted to go to do the Avera with the mistress, with his master's wife. He comes home, right, to do his work, 
and there's nobody there. And all of a sudden, when he's going to do the Avera, he realizes, he sees the image of his father go by the window. So there's many different explanations. What does that mean? Does that mean that he saw the Kisei HaKavod, according to the Marashah and others, that is if, because remember that Yaakov Avinu is the fourth chair, right? His fourth leg of the chair of the Kisei HaKavod, the throne of HaKadosh Baruch Hu. So all of a sudden he saw that. Did he see just another person that looked like his father? What exactly was going on here? In Kam Chachamim, and they say, very simple. All that had to happen was, is he saw an image of somebody that looked like his father. Dmut Diokno, something, it could have been coming a little different. But he sees just for one second and he gets a shock. And he says, how could I do that, Avera? How could I let down my father? How could I stoop so low to do such a thing? And immediately he ran out and he didn't do the Avera. But in order to do that, we have to realize and we have to listen to the messages. We have to understand what's going on. And that's exactly what the Roshiva was trying to tell the student. The student came and he sat down and he started to learn. It was about Shuba. It didn't go through. He tried once, two times, nothing. How many times? But it didn't work. So what does he do? He gives up or he's there, you know, like this. The Roshiva doesn't want to let him out. But if he lets him out, he realizes he's going to go back into the world. He could go back down. He could lose everything that he gained until now. So what does he do? He tells him, do whatever you want, but just make, make sure you stay here. Don't go anywhere else. Just stay here. That's what you have to do. So he said, okay, fine. Let's see what's going to happen. After a little while, he comes and he, and he figures something out that even the, 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 how do you call them? The electricistas, the electricians, they're not able to understand, to figure out. He comes and he tells him, you don't understand your abilities. You don't get the light. You don't get the message that Hashem is sending you. If you were able to figure it out and you're not an electrician and you were able to figure out it and they weren't able to figure it out, that means you're able to figure out anything if you really put your heart to it. So put your heart to it. Try. Go. But you have to listen to the messages. You have to understand what's happening. And that's why it was so important. I'm just going to mention this because I think it's very important. The, when they speak about the importance of prayers or the importance of not giving up, I'll mention this because this is the yesod that we need to have because this is the basis of every emunah that we have. You don't know how many times people come and they say, yeah, but Rabbi, I prayed so much and it didn't help. First of all, that saying that it didn't help, chas shalom is 100% sheket because it doesn't exist a prayer that doesn't help. Maybe it helped for a day, maybe it helped for a month, maybe it helped for a year. And we don't know it because we don't know the actual the calculations of HaKadosh Baruch Hu. We don't know what Hashem's judgments are or what's supposed to happen. And every prayer does have an effect. However, though, many times we give up too easy. We mentioned, this is Rav Pinkus. He comes and he says this incredible Yisod by Tefillah. He says, Moshe Rabbeinu prayed 515 times to come into Eretz Israel, to come into the land of Israel. Just like the numerical value of Ait Hanan and Hashem, that I'm going to plead to Hashem. Numerical value is 515, that's what he prayed. There the Midrash brings down that he had to stop it. That he told Moshe Rabbeinu, you're not allowed to pray anymore. And he swore in order to close all the gates of heavens. Because the powers of Moshe Rabbeinu, the Tefilot, were so powerful, they would tear through any gates. And he had to make sure that they wouldn't penetrate. And everyone asks themselves one second, why is it that Hashem let him pray 515 and not 516? And the answer is, is that if he would have prayed for 516, what would have happened? He would have went into the land of Israel. He would have been able to come in. Do you understand what we're just saying now? Says Rav Pinkus, when was the last time we prayed 515 times for something? When was the last time that we came and we never gave up after a month? And here you have a person, 515 tefillot. Do you know what that is? How many times do we pray for something and after five tefillot, we're already tired? We say, okay, fine, God, forget about it. I don't need it. Don't do me any favors. You understand? What does that mean? Do you know what 515 tefillot are? The rabbi doesn't. Uh, the, it's not on the personality of each person. Some people are in... You know, some people have a very strong willpower, some not. Sorry, I just want to take advantage of it and welcome my brother-in-law. He's from London. 
So we also have people from the other side of the of the pond. Oh, very nice. Where is he? Welcome. I'm here. Sorry. <laughs> okay, Bruchim I'm, I'm the one with the initials. <laughs> ah, okay, very good. Bruchim Abayim. Thank you. <laughs> very good. So <laughs> I'm going to talk about each person. Maybe your willpower is stronger than mine, so that's why you can you can do it for twenty times or a hundred times, and I, I don't have the same willpower. Very good. I'm going to. Oh, I closed it. I wanted to read to you one second. This is incredible. Uh, one second. You just reminded me of something. A genius is 1% inspiration and 99% perspiration. Yeah, you, you reminded me of that quote. That Again, that's also Thomas Edison. What does that mean? You're right. It's the willpower of every single human being. But that's why it was all connected to the last night's shoot and what I'm telling you today, everything depends on the willpower. Everything depends on the will of what you have. You're right, some people will not perspire, they'll actually, they won't persevere, they'll give up much more easily, but that's our job. Our job is to continue. Our job, and by the way, you should know, that trait was given to the Jewish nation. Rav, Rabbi Fran bring this down. I think it's in the name of Rav Shapiro also, Milublim. He comes and he says like this, you know, by Parashat Lech Lecha, Kadosh Baruch Hu comes and he tells Abraham Avinu, he takes him outside and he shows them the stars. And he tells Abraham Avinu, Ko so will be your, your, your descendants. Your descendants will be like the stars. And he asks, what's going on? What's the conversation? What, what's happening here? The dialogue between Akash Baruch Hu and Avram Avinu. So you know what happened? He told Avram Avinu, count the stars. Right? Every single one of you here in this group, if I would right now take you out at night, and not in the city, because in the city you could probably count the stars, because you don't see them. Right? With so much light that we have around us, you could actually, you won't see a lot of stars. But if I take you to a desert, and I'm going to take you, or I give you a big microscope or all these big things that you're going to have. And you see thousands upon thousands upon millions of stars. And I tell you to count them. What would you do? Just give, you what, what you do? give you an estimate. Give you an estimate. <laughs> I'll tell you, Mauricio, start again. <laughs> no, what do you guys say? What would you do? Did he start counting? He did start counting. Abraham Avinu, Chazak Oruch, he started counting. The testament is who carries on counting. <laughs> yeah, he continued going. Akadosh Baruch Hu told Abraham Avinu, Kol Yezarecha, your children are going to be like you. He said, why? Because you have to remember, for us that we are like the sheep with the 70 wolves around us, if we wouldn't have this perseverance, if we wouldn't have this willpower to continue, the Jewish nation would have been lost thousands of years ago. Think about every single power, superpower in the world. Where are they today? Egypt, you call Egypt a superpower. What's Egypt? Right? I read everything, all these things. Yeah? One second. So what happens is, I apologize, let me just uh, make sure that I'm able to do this. I just have to... Um, I'm just uh, making sure that I could get uh, another... Because if not, it's gonna throw me out of the Zoom, one second. Sorry, one second, let me just put the pause. So he says like this. So comes of Mir Shapiro and he says, that's the Yisod behind the Jewish nation. The perseverance is what we have to actually continue. So you're right. Maybe it depends on every single human being, right? On what they do, but that's the message behind it. Sorry, somebody has their hand up. They want to ask something? Yes, sorry. I didn't yeah, want no to problem. interrupt. Yeah, no uh, problem. Put your video, Sammy, I, let's see you. Uh, sorry? Let's see you, put your video. Uh, hold on. 
Uh, okay. So I was going to ask, um, how do I do the video? It's here. I was going to ask, um, is it, I, I agree about the perseverance, 100%, but is it not, um, is it not uh, an impossibility though? Why an I mean, impossibility? The task itself. This is me, sorry, hi. Yeah, how are you doing? <laughs> Is, is the uh, task itself not, uh, uh, it's futile in the sense that it's actually a physical impossibility to count the stars? Very good. So, and, but that's what a close who was trying to teach you. Do you know that one of the explanations in why is it that we had to learn, right? Why is it that we had to learn, um, we had to learn the Torah in our mother's stomach beforehand. Why? Why is it that we had to learn the, the, the Torah in the mother's stomach beforehand? And you know so what they say? Brain in us. Why? Because he says it was if it wouldn't be that you wouldn't learn Torah in your mother's stomach, it would be impossible, right? It would be completely impossible to actually understand it later, which means it was impossible. It doesn't exist. And therefore, that's why it's so important, right, of, uh, of what we're talking about. You understand? Meaning that all these things is, sorry, just one second. Again, it's giving me problems here. I just have to finish this. Confirm. Okay. Okay, now it's subscribing. Okay, fine. So hopefully it won't... Uh... Okay, now we have unlimited me meeting. Okay, very good. So I can continue. Sorry about that. I just had to make sure that it's able to continue. So basically like this. The concept is, is that if we wouldn't have learned Torah in our mother's stomach, in Achanami, it's true, it would have been impossible to learn Torah. And therefore, purposely, HaKadosh Baruch Hu put you in this world to realize that if you put your mind to something, there's really nothing that's impossible. It doesn't exist something that's impossible. It only depends in the mind of the human being. And that, by the way, you don't have to ask me. That you could look in whether it's psychology, you could look in uh, Einstein and what he wrote about the entire concept of how much percentage do we really use of our brain, right? All these things, you have it. Because they're met in truth, everything's in the mind. Do you know when they come and they try to train these people that, you know, they could come and they could, with their, their, their fists, they could break through bricks and they put a whole bunch of bricks and they smash all through them. What is the first thing that they teach them? Everything's in the mind. If you actually put in your mind that you could go through, your hand will break through the bricks, which now you right now will come and tell me, listen, if you try to break a brick wall, I had somebody, right, that what happened was he went, he was trying to play around, oh, boom. They punched the wall, broke his entire hand. <laughs> on the mind. And that's all that it is. It that's is but, but there are still constraints. There must, I mean, I mean, we are humans who liken ourselves to Hashem, correct? 100% right? so there are like constraints. Be, so you, you are, we, we, that's why we're, we're, Hashem is infinite, we're finite. I mean, by the very definition. Right. Of, of, no, we're mortals, 100%. But we must, we must realize that there's much more to our potential that we can actually accomplish. And usually the majority of what we do is we just, uh, I'll, I'll give you a yesod, right? Listen to this very carefully. And then I, I saw that Goldie wanted to ask something, but one second, right? It says like this, just remember the question, right? There is a very important Gemara that happened with Rish Lakish and Rabbi Yochanan. Rabbi Yochanan, right, was very, very handsome. He was the remnants of the beauty of Jerusalem. He was one of those handsome people that they said that he used to sit down on the gates of the Tevila for the women, so they should see his beauty and they should have beautiful children like him, just to show you. And he was fat, so beautiful. He was very today, heavy. He's not like beautiful today. <laughs> exactly, no, 100%. It was a completely different beautiful, right? It's a different beauty. I was okay. gonna say I could relate, but okay. <laughs> <laughs> Fine. So he says like this, he says, all of a sudden he sees Rashakish that he was able to jump from one side to another side of the river in one shot. Right? That means basically he wasn't talking about a small little tiny. He leaped and he was able to jump it and he was able to make it. So Rabbi Yochanan went and he said, your strength should go to the Torah. Your strength should go to the Torah. So Rishakish answers him. They're very smart people in the olden days. He said, your beauty should go to women. Right? Why are you so beautiful? He's telling him, you know, your strength. Why are you so beautiful? So he says, you know what? Let's make a deal. Right? Jews are always making deals, no matter where they are. Remember that, yeah? So he said, let's make a deal. He says, what's the deal? I have a sister that she's even more beautiful than I am. Start learning Torah, and I'll give you my sister. 
this is a thief. Then Shakish was a bandit. That when he went up to Shamayim, his friends looked at him and they went and they saw him in Gan Eden and they said, hey, I, what are you doing up there? Come down here with us. What, uh, your entire life you were with us. He said, no, he did Teshuvah. Look where he is now. And what happened? What happened was, is that, says the Gemara, the second that he accepted upon himself to learn Torah, he tried to leap back and he fell. He wasn't able to do it. And everyone asks, why? So the answer, The Torah makes a person weak. So everyone asks, does the Torah really make a person weak? Yaakov Avinu, that he was a muda Torah. He was a pillar of Torah. He came and while all the shepherds had to wait in order for them to take off this rock, he came and he just picked it up like nothing happened. And it says there, the Ramban, Kovei Hashem Yachalifu Koach. That HaKadosh Baruch Hu rejuvenates, he revives the strength inside of the Jew when he learns Torah, if you have belief in Hashem. So what happened? So they come and they said, right, this happens all the time in Israel. So I'll have to say it in Israel, but then I'll, I'll say it in, in another language. Many times it happens that you ask your child, listen, can you do me a favor, take out the, the garbage. So here in America, they'll tell you, I don't want to. In Israel, they say, En koach. Yeah, I don't have strength. Enli koach. Yeah, you ask a child in Israel, in Israeli, enli koach. No, but why didn't you do that? Enli koach, enli koach. Everything's enli koach. Now, one second. You turn around, and the same child that just told you two seconds ago that he says enli koach, he's jumping up. Ta, ta, ta. He's all over. He's bouncing on the walls. Enli koach. You don't have strength. Look where you're jumping. What do you mean enli koach? Well, the answer is, enli koach means that it's not important to me. And if it's not important to me, I don't have the strength to do it. That's the interpretation. Meaning if you find that it's important, you'll do it. How many times does it happen that you ask a person, why couldn't you get up for shakrit? They can't wake up at six in the morning for shakrit. I tell him, even once, come once. I can't do it, Rabbi. It's impossible. The next day he comes and he tells me, Rabbi, I'm going out of town. Where are you going? I'm going to France, to Israel, to this. Ah, very nice. When's your flight? At five in the morning. One second, how are you going to get up exactly? Well, <laughs> Rabbi, I have a flight. I can't miss the flight. One second, one second, one second. No, just, oh, oh, but it's, it's only one off. No, you could, it's only one off. One second. Is it important or is it important? If it's important, you'll find a way to do it. If it's not important, you won't care about it. It's not important. Put it on the back corner. Ah, don't worry about it. You come, you ask the first one, ah, it's not as important. That's what and, I love, it, love. and it's true. Exams. You'll see people coming and not sleeping for weeks and they're doing their exams. Afterwards, you come and you tell them something. Ah, oh, I don't have any strength. I'm tired. I'm this. I'm that. I'm gone. When you had the exams, why did you have the strength? Right? When it's tax season, go ask the accountants until what time they stay up and every single night. When it's the end of the year, people, when you find it important, you'll do it. And that's what happens whether it's with Torah and you got Shemaim as well. Resh Shakish, the second he accepted upon himself the acceptance of Torah, he didn't find it important anymore to jump, to make the leap that far anymore. And therefore, he wasn't able to do it anymore because it wasn't important. That's the explanation that the Torah makes a person weak. It makes a person weak because every single thing other than Torah is not important. So they come and they tell you, do this. I don't have strength. I'm a weakling. Why are you a weakling? Because the most important thing that I have in my life is Torah. Everything else is nonsense. Now, the truth is with everything. Okay? Goldie, you wanted to answer, to ask something? Oh, sorry, just one second. Did, you, did I answer the question? No. Yes, yeah, thank you. Yeah? Okay, pleasure. Yeah. I feel like there's such a contradiction because 100% I agree that if you pray, you're 100% and like you have full emunah, full bitachon Hashem, 100% will give you everything you want. But at the same time, I know that like no matter how much you want something and Hashem knows it's not right for you, Hashem will not give you that specific thing so like how's that so the answer to that is is that that's actually a revisal salanter the difference of praying on shabbat you know on shabbat you're not allowed to pray, pray for personal needs mm -hmm. but you're allowed to pray for spiritual needs because for spirituality no matter what hashem wants you to have it so if you pray you'll get it for physical Sometimes it's not good for you. 
So no matter how much you pray, Hashem won't give it to you because it's just not for your good. And therefore there you have to be careful. So he only fully answers when it's spiritual, when it comes to When physical. it's spiritual, he will answer. But now there's a lot of things which are spiritual. Children, we might think is physical. It's spiritual. Marriage is spiritual. What's one of the proofs that marriage is spiritual? Marriage, do you know there's a famous Rambam? The Rambam says, he's basing himself off a of Gemara. The Gemara says, that call me shamayim chutz mirat shamayim. Everything comes from heaven except for fear of God. Because if he would give you fear of God, so then there's no test. There's nothing there. So therefore, everything comes from Hashem. If a person's going to get a virus, not a virus, it comes from Hashem. If a person's going to learn or not learn, that doesn't come from Hashem. It comes from us. When we start, Hashem will help. But we have to want it. It has to come from us. It has to come from within. And we have to do it. So now what happens? The Rambam says, do you know there's a Gemara, a famous Gemara that says that 40 days, right, from the onset of when a person is born, which is basically the night of the, right, the night that they're together, the mikveh, what happens is, is that there's a bat call. A heavenly voice that comes out and says, Ploni le plonit, bat ploni le plonit. This girl is going to marry this boy. That's what's brought down in the Gemara. Says the Rambam, I disagree. Says, why? Says the Rambam, marriage is a mitzvah. It's a mitzvah to get married. So if it's a mitzvah to get married, how could the Kosh Baruch decree upon me who I'm going to get married to? It's, it's a mitzvah. So they already, that's why the Rambam says it doesn't exist. It doesn't exist. They all answer up the Rambam. And they say, no, you know what it is? The explanation is very simple. It's true, you have the right and the willpower whether to get married or not. But if you already decide who to get married to, here's your Vishert, here's your, your one and only. Right? Why? Because that comes from HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Because that's your mazal and that's everything that's going to happen. But it's true, the actual marriage in itself, you're the one that's going to decide if you want to get married or not. If person wants, he can just decide he doesn't want to get married. It's up to him. It's his mitzvah that he's losing out. But if he already decides that he's going to get married, this is what's going to happen. So that's also spiritual. So marriage is spiritual. Children is spiritual. Right? A lot of things are spiritual. But if I want a new suit or a new right, Rolls Royce outside, that's not spiritual. So there, if he's not going to answer me, maybe by met, it wasn't for my best. And therefore, if he's not going to answer me, there's a reason for it. And I'm not allowed to pray for it on Shabbat. And the reason why I'm not allowed to pray for it on Shabbat is because anything that I'm not sure that I'm going to be answered, I'm going to be upset about it. So imagine I'm going to pray and then I'm going to be upset because I wasn't answered. So I'm going to be sad on Shabbat. You're not allowed to be sad on Shabbat. So therefore, anything which is physical, you're not allowed to pray. So Spiritual, health. pray whatever you want. So health, no? Well, the health in itself, if the health is for the spiritual, then you're allowed to. There are there is certain exceptions to the rule that, for example, in Birkat Amazon, we do say that Achamans, and part of that Achamans is even Parnasan and things like that, because that was not really for us. It was in general, and that was just like you know. It's, but it's not that we're focusing on trying to pray for something uh, you know physical. You know that's mm -hmm. that's what they say. Mm -hmm. uh, Thank you. Rabbi, so when you pray for a third person, for somebody else. I don't know. I understand what you said with the prayer. I pray for God. I pray for somebody else, for whatever it is, for them maybe to change their ways or for them to have health or whatever. It's not up, it's really not, well, it's never up to me, but if it's up to me, I pray for Hashem, give me this, give me that. It's for me. When I pray for somebody else, for a third party, how, how, do I get answer? Because I depend on the third person. I, it's, it's not, on, it's, I, I, don't, I don't know if I'm explaining myself. When I pray for me, uh, you know, God, give me this, God, give me that. Maybe I can work for it. Please, God, uh, help me to study more Torah. So it's also, my, as you say, it's my willpower. But if I'm praying for somebody else, plus, uh, please, God, help him to learn Torah or to do Teshuvah, it's up to, that, to, the, to the other person. How would that work? Okay, very good question. I, I think Moises had a question also. Is it the same, around the same yes, area? Yes, yes. Not? not the same, but uh, my question is, that I understand that I understand that the, if a person uh, prays with passion and uh, he wants to go to the wrong way, uh, Hashem maybe maybe how do you say puede cumplir ese deseo, no? Seguro, 100%. That was that was with uh, Balak. 
והקדוש ברוך הוא, בדרך שאדם רוצה ללך, בא מוליכין אותו. The path which you choose, that's the path that הקדוש ברוך הוא takes you on that path. So beside that, that Hashem who knows that this is not uh, a good way for him, he will, uh, he will uh, uh, accept the, the, the prayer? He will still accept the prayers, remember, because HaKadosh Baruch Hu, in this world, he left it as a world of trial and error that he wanted to give us reward. And therefore, we have that choice whether to do positive or negative. He will never close the door. If a person wants to become Chas Shalom, the biggest Rasha, he's going to let him, and he'll help him. Why? Because the person wants to become a Rasha. So he'll help him. But that's all the will, because HaKadosh Baruch Hu is the one that helps. Right? There is a difference, though. It says that by a Rasha, they open up the doors for him. They say by a Tzaddik, when you want to do Teshuvah, they help you. So there's a big difference. To do with a Rasha, they just open up the doors, and now you do whatever you want. To do with it becoming better, they actually help you become better. So there's a big difference in that. The thief, the thief prays to be successful. Exactly, and he gets answered. And he still gets answered, 100%. Fine. So to answer your question, Mauricio, is actually the question of the Marsha on the Gemara Mesech Berachot. The Marsha asks, in Mesech Berachot, there was a machloket between a husband and a wife. Sounds familiar, no? <laughs> right? But this machloket is not like a regular machloket, take out the garbage, I don't have strength, Eli Koach. No, 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 no. The machloke between them was, Rabbi Meir Balanes comes and he prays for these bandits that he has in his vicinity, in his neighborhood, that they should die. Comes his wife, Ruria, and she says, what are you praying? You should pray that they should do Teshuvah. Not that they should die. They should do Teshuvah. Why? They bring it upon a pasuk, Avitamu Chataim Min Haaretz. It's a pasuk in, in Tehilim that says, that the Chataim should vanish from the world. He was learning Chataim, the sinners. She says, it doesn't say Chataim, the sinners. Chataim, the sins, should vanish from the world. Meaning, don't pray for a Rasha to die. Pray for him to do Teshuvah, that he won't do any more Rishut. So ask the Marasha, one second. If I call me Shemaim, Chutz Mirat Shemaim, and if everything spiritual has to do with us, what does it help for me to pray for you? How does that work? How does that work exactly? It doesn't make sense. Okay? And the Marashat comes and gives an incredible answer. And he says, through your tefillot, what's going to happen is, is that the Rasha will see the messages. He will see other Rishayim get punished for things that happen in his life that will bring him back to do Teshuvah. The Rasha is the one deciding to do the Teshuvah. But through your prayers, you were the catalyst to start the domino effect and now something happened and all, oh, it triggered. I woke him up, I, I'm not going to do Teshuvah. Because you cannot make him do Teshuvah, it's impossible, it's his choice. That's the Marashah's answer. That's one answer, and I, but I'll finish off with another answer of Dessler. Rav Dessler says in the Mikhtav Mel Yau, he says every single human being is here as a utensil. And many times we're here for the utensil of the tzaddikim. And therefore he says, what does that mean exactly? That means that when we have now a tzaddik, and he's going to pray, and now through his prayers, it's going to get answered, and there's a kiddush, sorry, there's a kiddush Hashem involved, HaKadosh Baruch Hu will come, and he'll pick up your level. Which means like this, we spoke about this a long time ago, Right, probably I think it was a year or no, probably two years ago or three years ago. We spoke about Lot. And we said, every single human being, how does it work when they have their free will? How does free will work? And we said, it's like the trenches. In World War I, there was trenches. What is the trenches? There's no man's land. And then you have France and Germany on both sides. This land belongs to France. This land belongs to Germany. And then there's no man's land. The fighting only occurs in no man's land. The fighting does not occur on the other side. They didn't have yet all the bombs and the planes and everything that happened. It only happened here in the center. Everything else, there was no fighting. How do you win? You advance. Everyone used to get out of the trenches on one side, start running to the other side, start killing everyone, and get into the other trenches. 
they used to retreat and go back and dig another trench. So now I just advanced and I continue going. Now there's a new battlefield. The new battlefield is with an advanced, right, trenches. So he says the exact same thing happens with every single Jew in this world. For example, if you are Shomer Shabbat, will you ever have a mindset to be Mechalel Shabbat? Obviously not. Why? There's no battle there. But to speak Lashon Hara, that we're always fighting, there's always going to be a fight. If it's going towards Tefillah, so I'll give you guys the, the, the concept of Tefillah. At the beginning, a person doesn't go to pray at all. So what happens? The fight is, should I even pray at home or not? And even when I pray at home, do I pray with Tefillin, with Tefillin for five minutes, for 10 minutes, Kriyat Shema, Amida, okay. All of a sudden I do Teshuvah, and now I'm going to pray every single day at home. Fine. So now the fight is not to pray or not. I'm for sure going to pray. Do I have, how do I pray? Fine. All of a sudden I do more Teshuvah. Now I'm going to go to the Beta Knesset. So now I never miss going to synagogue. So now the fight is not to go to the synagogue or not. I'm always going to go to the synagogue. So what's the fight? Do I get there on time or do I get there for the last 20 minutes? So okay, bye. I continue. More Teshuvah. I get there every single day on time. Right? Now what do I do? Do I talk? Do I not talk? After that, do I pay attention, not pay attention, concentrate? The, the fight is always in a certain boundary. Anything which is too much above, there's no fight. If a person's not Shomer Shabbat, he's not going to come and say, you know what, one second, is this Boren on Shabbat separating food for Shabbat? He's not, he's Mechalel Shabbat. He doesn't keep Shabbat. So for him, it's not even a fight. It's either too above or too below. So where is the fight between the good inclination and the evil inclination? No man's land, right here. Says of Desser, when you become a utensil for the tzaddik to pray for you and you make a kiddush Hashem, what HaKadosh Baruch Hu does is he advances it and it just goes up level. And by doing that, you still have your free will. Your free will is always there. The free will will never be taken away from you. But all it is is it gives you a notch. It gives you like a boost. And that boost gives you the pick to pick it up in order to continue going. And that's the answer to your question. Okay. Okay, so Bezat Hashem, I hope uh, everyone enjoyed. I apologize for the balagam with the, you know, the, the videos, the this, the that. But, uh, so let's do it, let's uh, do it, it Hashem, next week. Let's